Good morning and welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church in Poughkeepsie, New York and our virtual worship series. This video is for Sunday, August 30th, 2020, which is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. We hope that you are all safe and healthy during this pandemic and we want you to know that our, our thoughts and prayers are with all of those who are have been, are, and will be affected by the devastation left behind by Hurricane Laura. In the meantime, let's frame our hearts and minds before God as we prepare to worship this morning. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, full of compassion and mercy and abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting now in Christ's great promise of forgiveness, let us now turn our hearts toward God in a moment of humble confession. Eternal God, our Creator, you are our breath and our very life. We are the work of your hands. We are the children of your creation. We confess that we have often turned from you and sought our own path through life. Forgive us our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, that you may be our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even while we were still far away and has given us a new life through our Lord Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved, and in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, God now forgives you all your sins. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. O God, we thank you for your Son, who chose the path of suffering for the sake of the world. Humble us by his example. Point us to the path of obedience, and give us the strength to follow your commands. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew in the 16th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. From that time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. During our vacation, I was watching a, a rather large boat traveling along the Erie Canal, and it had just passed through one of the locks that are there. And I was thinking about how difficult it can be to navigate a vessel like that through those narrow locks. You know, one little mistake could cause a whole lot of damage and drama. Uh, so, the skipper needs to have the correct orientation, you know, of the, not just the vessel, but of his own or her own mind. Because I, in my own life, I've seen all too often what happens when skippers and captains get disoriented. So um, I say that because there's some orientation happening in today's scriptures as well. When we read that, that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem, well, he was, in fact, orienting himself to that destination, physically, but also mentally. And, and back in the first 
reading, um, God makes a comment about Jeremiah's orientation where God says, you know what, if you turn back, I'll take you back. And then later God says to Jeremiah, it is they who will turn to you. So there's all this, you know, orientation and reorientation happening. And today's gospel text begins with an explanation about how Jesus is changing the orientation of his teachings. We hear as it begins, from that time on, Jesus began to show them this other thing which is to say Jesus began to explain a different story, a different purpose, a different goal, a different orientation to the disciples, which was very confusing to them. And I can understand why. It was it seemed to be a radical shift in orientation, like crashing broadside into the side of the lock, you know? So orientation whether it's a journey through the canal or the journey through the cross, it has something to do with our, um, our intention and our intentionality, you know, where we are, which way we're going to turn, and what we're going to do next. Speaking of orientation, Peter, <laughs> who, who needs an orientation, right? Peter had a certain orientation in today's gospel lesson, too. Um, physically, emotionally, and mentally. When he pulls Jesus aside, he's standing in a certain place, he's facing in a certain direction, as it in, and his intentions are, are clearly evident when he says, Jesus, don't talk like that. He had oriented himself um, as if like this, facing Jesus and pushing intellectually maybe even physically against Jesus, trying to reorient his teacher. But then Jesus rebukes him and says, you know, Peter, you're the one who needs to change your orientation. He says, get behind me. You're thinking like everybody else right now. He says, don't even tempt me to change my own orientation. See, he calls Peter Satan, but Satan remember, is the tempter, the force of temptation, the one who stands between you and what you know needs to get done. You know, what you want and what you need to do, what your desire is and what's the right thing to do. Satan is that force who tries to change your orientation, to change your intention in the world, in your life, in your heart. Get behind me, Jesus says, Orient yourself so that you can see where I'm going, not just where I've been. <laughs> How do we orient ourselves in our own lives, in our relationships? Do we stand against people, pushing them to do what we think is best? Or do we stand next to or even behind them? working to see what their intentions are and doing our best to support them in their goals. How do we orient ourselves in the world? Are we more interested in what we want to accomplish? Are we interested in getting our own opinions enforced? Are we interested in gaining, I don't know, power, control, or do we stand behind others using our gifts in support and service. And then looking at Peter and Jesus in this gospel, how do we orient ourselves toward God? Do we stand against asking God to only do what we want? <laughs> do we stand behind God asking to see more clearly what we might do to help? You see, our orientation it says a lot about our intentions. Our orientation is the direction in which we will live, the direction in which we will step, the peripatetic of our lives, if you will, the steps we take. After Jesus rebukes Peter, then he begins to explain exactly how people can reorient themselves, themselves in their lives in order to, to truly stand behind Christ instead of against him. And 
The explanation is this two words, scary words. He says, deny yourself. But that's not the same thing, deny yourself. It's not the same thing as, as you know, um, hate yourself. A lot of times we think deny yourself means, well, I have to hate myself. Christianity is not going to get very far with a bunch of self-deprecating people who beat themselves up all the time about how bad they are. Guilt is not the way to deny yourself, okay? Um, denying yourself, it's also, it's also not the same as, as having to give everything up or give everything away necessarily. Um, think about it. Giving everything up doesn't automatically make you a Christian. It just makes you empty and poor. It's not the giving up of stuff. It's the orientation, why you have the stuff, what it means to you, um, what your intention is with the stuff you have. That's what makes the difference. That's what Jesus is talking, even with the rich young ruler, it was about the, the rich young ruler's orientation toward his stuff. What defines you? What steps do you take with what you have? What stands in the way between you and God? You know, how do you get through the locks of life without smashing into the sides? Um, you know, we live in this culture where, where success is too often defined as power, status, possessions, you know, where the orientation is self-serving. And Jesus is challenging Peter and all of us to change our orientation from what the prevailing culture wants to tell us. So denying yourself, um, let's try this. There's another translation of this text when he says, if any of you want to be my followers, deny yourself. How about this? This translation says, if any of you want to be my followers, you must forget about yourself. Or to reemphasize, you must forget about yourself. With that orientation, you can use your gifts not to be satiated, but to serve. If you think about that, you know, then your confidence is no longer in what you can um, accomplish in life, but your confidence is what in what Jesus has already accomplished for us through the cross. See, deny yourself, forget about yourself. Then he says, take up your cross and follow me. So when you take up the cross and follow him, remember the cross is that symbol of Roman authority. That was the literal cross that when the Roman government was going to um, execute you by means of the cross, that cross said that you lost your public identity and your private identity and you had become the property of Rome and you no longer mattered. But what mattered was Rome owned you. They had control over you and they were going to execute that control over you by executing you on the cross. And that was your statement that you belonged to Rome and Rome's statement that they owned you and you no longer mattered. That's the irony of the whole cross when Jesus says, take up my cross. My cross is easy. My burden is light because Jesus is the opposite of Rome. But when you take up your cross and make that public statement that you don't matter anymore, that your identity is wrapped up in Christ, it's actually better than who you were before. And that's what he means when he says, you know, those who lose their lives will save them. Because if you lose your life, you forget about yourself and worry about God's identity in your heart and God's Holy Spirit filling you with his identity. You know, your life isn't important anymore, but you have more of his life to give. So, all right, that's all still fancy explanation, but how does that work in everyday practice, you know? Um, well, Paul explains it pretty well in his letter to the Romans, which, which I didn't read you this morning for the video, but it's in Romans chapter 12, um, verses starting in verse nine or so. But I'll give you a couple things that he says. Paul gives us a really good, specific, nice to explain list of how Jesus expects us to orient ourselves and 
forget about ourselves and live within him. So I'll just give you a couple right now. Uh, verse 10, Paul says, love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another, showing honor. Extend hospitality to strangers. Um, then he says, don't claim to be wiser than you are. And then he continues and he says, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. And then he says, no, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If your enemies are thirsty, give them something to drink. Don't be overcome by evil, he says, but overcome evil with good. <laughs> those, those are, that's clear, but it's very difficult to do. Um, love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. You know, Paul's writing this, by the way, to the Romans, um, who were having, you know, this still problem. They still executed people via the cross. And so Paul is trying to get the Romans to understand the, the, the Christian orientation of, of the within Rome, the Roman Christians and the Roman non-Christians, how to live together and how to view each other with a little more integrity. Um, so, but back to this gospel, here's Peter. He hasn't heard this stuff from Paul yet. Uh, what Peter doesn't understand um, on this day when he confronts Jesus and pulls him aside and pushes against him and says, stop talking like that. What Peter doesn't understand is this bottom line that it's not about Peter. Um, it's not about us. When we stop focusing on ourselves, when we stop focusing on what in the world we need, um, it makes it easier for us to sense what the world needs from us. You know, when we stop focusing on ourselves, we'll, we'll finally really be able to stand behind each other and behind God. So try it this week. Forget about yourself for Christ's sake, and then you'll discover who you can really be in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now we orient our hearts by professing our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Now, Lord, confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we take a moment to pray for the church, for the world, and for all who are in any kind of need. God of faithfulness, you bid your people to follow Jesus. Set the mind of your church on divine things. Orient us to trust in you, that we could lose our lives for the sake of Christ and thereby discover the joy in life through him. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of wonder, the earth is yours and all that is in it. Heal your creation and give us eyes to see the world the way you do. Help us to celebrate today's flowers placed in the chancel by Ginny Hahn to the glory of God and in loving memory of her husband, Harold. And also, Lord, be present for all those who are suffering the loss and the devastation caused by Hurricane Laura. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all nations, you call us to live peaceably with everyone. Give us ears to hear one another, even those we name as enemies. Fill all leaders with mercy and understanding 
that they may advocate and genuinely care for those who are poor and most vulnerable in their communities. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of salvation, you promised to deliver us. Give those who suffer a strong sense of your presence and love. Accompany those who are uncertain. Raise the spirits of those who are despairing and heal the sick. Especially this week, we lift up Tony Simmons and Eric Garrison and all those whose names we lift up now, either aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of community, you call us to rejoice in hope, to be patient in suffering, and to persevere in prayer. Make our congregation a workshop of your love. When we quarrel, bring reconciliation. Help us to overcome all evil with all good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all grace, you give us everlasting life. In love, we recall your holy ones who now live in your undying light. In our remembering, Grant us a foretaste of the feast that is to come. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And so it is in the certain hope that nothing can ever separate us from your love that we lift all of these prayers to you and more through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior. Amen. And now may the peace of God be with you always. Take a moment to share the peace with each other in a room. Um, Make a call, send a text, let somebody know that God loves them too. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now one more prayer before we go. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you sent light to conquer all darkness, and you sent the bread of heaven to nourish all your people. Send us forth with the healing power of this gift of our very life, that we may be oriented to serve you more fully by loving our neighbors more deeply. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you, May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon each one of you with favor and grant you peace. Amen. And remember, you are the body of Christ, raised up for the world. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for being with us this week, and we look forward to seeing you either in church or on video next week.